us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the assurance that indeed um, all that the Father gives to you, you will not lose, not even one. What a precious reality that is for us as we walk through this world and as we live through the dangers of this world and the dangers of our own sin. Thank you for your keeping power through our faith. Lord, you are good and you are kind and you are trustworthy. Lord, would you please now draw near to us as we look at your Bible, look at your words. We want to see what these words say about you and we want these words from you to us to change us to make us more like Jesus, to make us love the gospel more. Draw near to us, we ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen. Please be seated. We begin this morning looking at Romans 1, finally. So turn to Romans 16, because I want you to see something there as we start. I promise we will get to Romans 1. But I want to start in Romans 16, verses 1 and 2, because that's the chapter that lists all of these names of people in the church in Rome, except for the first one. She is not from the church in Rome. Romans 16, verse 1, Paul says, I commend to you, Romans, our sister Phoebe who is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria. Sancria is the port city for the city of Corinth, and Paul is writing this letter from Corinth around AD 56, you remember. And he is commending this woman who is in this church that he's a part of in Corinth at the time. He's commending her to the Romans. In what way? Verse 2, that you Romans receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. She's a believer. She's a sister in the Lord. She's saint, called saint, as you'll see this morning. And that you help her, you Romans help her in whatever she may need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. So she supported Paul's ministry and she is coming to Rome. So understand this. Phoebe is Paul's letter carrier. Not Timothy, not Titus, or any one of his other co-laborers in the gospel, but this Christian woman whom Paul knew from Sincrea. With that in mind, what I want you to do is I want you to put yourself back into Rome the day they got this letter. Let's put ourselves back into Rome. Let's imagine that we are the church in Rome, and we are gathered together for worship. We're gathered together for fellowship, and then she walks in. A woman who is not a part of our regular fellowship, and there appears to be a scroll in her hand, and she hands the letter over to one of the elders, and she introduces herself as Phoebe from Sancria. She's a believer in Jesus Christ. And the letter is for the church. So everyone gathers in more closely so that we can hear the letter that she has brought. And so the elder opens the scroll, and now you can turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And the first word out of his mouth as he begins to read is, Paul. Paul. The Paul, we would all start thinking. What is Paul's concern with us? Most of us had probably heard about him. So why is he writing to us? What interest does he have in us? And look at that letter. It's longer than any letter we've ever personally seen. And, and these words that introduce us to Paul in verses 1 to 7, these are longer than ever 
in what is commonly in most letters of introduction. Normally, do you know what a, a, an introduction in a letter would look like? It would look like this. Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, verse 7. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's all of this between 2 and 6? I'll give you a hint. It, it's the gospel. What is Paul trying to accomplish with in us and for us as we are the Romans who have just heard this, just getting this letter. Well, let's read his introduction, verses 1 to 7. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is the gospel of God concerning his son, verse 3, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for us today, especially after what we've done the last two weeks together um, of introducing Romans to ourselves, we know why Paul is writing this letter. We've talked about it for two weeks. And, but, but can you appreciate how the Romans, that very first time they were together and the letter was opened up, they had no idea what was going on. They didn't know why Paul was writing to them. They wouldn't have known the purpose of the letter until they really began reading all of it. And chapter 1 would have given them a little bit of information, some clues as to why Paul was writing, but they would have to wait for chapter 15 to really find out the rest of the reason. Do you remember why Paul wrote? Remember we talked about this. Paul is writing to the church in Rome with the hopes of establishing them in the gospel to establish them in the gospel with the intent that they will then become endeared to the expansion of that gospel. And particularly for Paul, what that looks like is he's going to try to take the gospel to Spain, and he wants to make sure that the church that will send him on his way, the Romans, that they will be well established in this gospel and then send him on to Spain. We know that, but they didn't know that when they first got the letter from Phoebe. So with his introduction, the first seven verses, Paul aims to hook them, to snag them, to interest them, to compel them to keep reading. And that is why the intro isn't verse one and then only verse seven. Paul needs a longer than usual introduction than any of his other letters because they don't know him. He didn't plant them as a church. He has never visited them. And perhaps some of them have heard some of the lies about him that the Jews have circulated. And maybe they don't trust him. And immediately Paul needs to make the case to them that they should listen to what he has written. And his introduction is his attempt to compel them to keep reading, to rally behind him. How does Paul do it? by presenting to them in his introduction God's provisions to sinners for salvation. That's what this passage is all about. Do you see it up on the screen now? God's three provisions for sinners, to sinners for salvation that are there to compel even us today to keep reading, to keep reading, to consider Paul's letter. So let's get started. Let's talk about the first provision of God. It's number one, God's apostle. That's right. That's God's apostle. God's first provision to sinners for salvation that should compel the Romans to listen him, to him is actually himself. And you say, what? Paul, as an apostle, is an amazing provision from God for the nations, for the Gentiles. 
so that they may be saved by grace through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where does Paul start regarding himself as he introduces himself? What do they need to know about him that will compel them to hear him out in this letter? Look, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Just scratch out bondservant and write in slave because that's what the word means, slave. Before Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, which is really where he's headed, he was a slave of Jesus. Paul was a purchased possession of Jesus He belonged entirely to Jesus Christ. Jesus absolutely owned him as his own. Paul was not an employee of Jesus, and Paul was not a servant of Jesus because those can quit their job and resign and put in a two weeks notice, but a slave of Jesus cannot give Jesus a two weeks notice nor resign. Being the slave of Jesus means that Paul then isn't after his own desires, Because Paul lost his own desires when he became Christ's slave. Paul is not the one determining the course of his life. Even the writing of this letter is an expression of Jesus' um, ownership of Paul, of Paul's slavery to Jesus. The Lord is behind this letter, not Paul. They can be assured that Paul is not writing with the intent to dominate them for himself, he's writing as one who has been dominated by Jesus. And the word slave in Paul's day was an abhorrent idea. It was a revolting word, a term loaded with contempt in a Roman's mind because in a Roman's mind, there was no greater insult than to be deprived of your freedom. Paul will make it very clear in Romans 6 that all believers are slaves of Jesus Christ He owns the believer in Jesus Christ because he paid the ransom price for the believer with the currency of his own blood, right? And Paul is one of these slaves first and foremost. He's just like the Romans. And like them, he depended on his master for everything. His master's provision for him was the only possession he ever had. Paul was nothing on his own. He owned nothing apart from what Jesus gave him as his master. Paul continues in introducing himself, called as an apostle, better just to translate it, a called apostle, a called apostle. What he means by calling himself a called apostle is that his apostleship was divinely initiated. He means that he was an apostle because Christ effectually called him into the office. Now, now what difference would that make to the Romans? He wasn't self-appointed. He wasn't following his boyhood dream to be an apostle one day. Paul didn't intrude upon the office of apostle. The Lord Jesus just called Paul, and Paul was instantly an apostle on the Damascus Road. Converted, commissioned. They don't have to worry about if these ideas in this really long letter are Paul's own weird ideas as a slave. His ideas are lost, and they are set aside for Christ's. As an apostle, he represents Jesus because he is Christ's called apostle. Apostle means sent one, a sent messenger, a sent representative of another Jesus had a special set of apostles who represented him. There were the 12 and then this one untimely born Paul. They were men who had actually seen Jesus Christ raised from the dead and who were personally then commissioned by him to represent him on his gospel mission across the world. Paul is like Jesus' ambassador. The apostle doesn't speak for himself. It's not his message. He only speaks the message and the will of the one who sent him, who is Jesus. And he speaks with the authority of that one. That's what it means to be an apostle. This is Paul. And and though Paul is describing himself with these two terms, neither of these two terms terminate in themselves and make you keep looking at Paul. To hear that Paul is a slave would have only led the Romans to think, well, who owns him? Jesus. 
to hear that Paul was an apostle would have only led them to think, well, who sent him? It's Jesus in both cases. They should listen carefully. But Paul has even more for the Romans to consider concerning himself. Verse 1, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was taken out of wherever he was prior as a foolish Pharisee. He was made a slave of Jesus, called an apostle, and in so doing, he was set apart for good news. That's what gospel means. And the good news, notice, is from God. It's the gospel of God. The gospel is the good news about the person and work of God's Son to accomplish salvation for sinners. That gospel demands a response. It does not suggest a response. It demands a response to repent and believe. Two commands given. Repent of your sin, believe Jesus. Those are not suggestions. It's not good advice. The good news puts a demand on all who hear it. It's not good advice that people of potential need. It is not good advice for you about what you might do to make your potentials come to fulfillment. It is good facts. It's good news about what God has done, not about what you go do, but about what God has done to save sinners from his own wrath through Jesus' death on the cross. God is the author of that. God is the owner of this good news. The gospel wasn't rooted in Paul, the slave, the apostle sent. It was God's and God's alone. It's rooted in God and what he has done in Jesus for sinners like you and me. How is Paul an important provision of God to sinners for salvation? If you get Paul, you get the gospel. That's his point. The slave serves his Lord's gospel interests. The apostle delivers his Lord's message, bearing the authority of his Lord. In short, do you know why we Gentiles so far away from Jerusalem have come to believe in Jesus Christ? How on earth would it ever have left Jerusalem without commissioned apostles heading towards the nations? Why do we Gentiles believe in Jesus Christ? Because the Lord Jesus had a slave whom he called to be his authoritative representative and from Jerusalem into the nations to take his message. That one was set apart for the gospel. The Lord Jesus means for getting his gospel into the nations, into the Gentile world, was through this slave and apostle of Jesus. The Romans need to keep listening, and so do we, which leads us to God's second provision, God's gospel. God's gospel. As Paul has made clear, if you get Paul, you get the gospel, and you'll see even more how he is inseparable from this gospel. Now, let's be clear. He is not a co-redeemer. You do not have to believe in Paul to be saved. That is not what Paul is insinuating here at all. But he is the message. He is the tool that God used to put that gospel out there. No tool, no gospel. But Jesus did it this way. Paul focuses us then onto two important issues relating to the gospel from verses um, 2 through 6. The first one is God's gospel is not new in verse 2, and God's gospel centers on God's son in verses 3 to 6. Let's take the first one. Number one, God's gospel is not new. Look at verse 2. The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That verse is a parenthesis. It's a relative clause which helps Paul to say something important about the gospel that he wants to say, but it's not his main point for the gospel. That's going to come in verses 3 and following. What Paul wants to make clear, though, about the gospel, first off, is that he was set apart for something that was not a new idea on the day. 
It's not a new idea on the scene, but something very, very old. The gospel is not new news. The good news is old news. It was promised beforehand. And the Roman believers would have heavily relied in their day on the Old Testament scriptures like any other church in the first century because they had not yet collected all of these letters by AD 56. If they've never met Paul, they don't know Paul at all, and are concerned about what he teaches concerning the gospel, this would provide great comfort and would even compel them to keep reading because they can be assured that Paul's message can be found in the scriptures that they already have. Paul says God promised it beforehand. God's gospel in Jesus here as he's he's preaching it is not a break from God's past work in salvation history, but it is in alignment with it. In the Old Testament, the gospel was in what we might call promise form. And in that promise form, it was powerful for salvation to everyone who believed it. But Israel didn't know the great lamb of God to atone for their sins yet. They had to keep sacrificing the other lambs. They didn't know his name was Jesus and that he was from Nazareth yet in the Old Testament. But the good news in Promise form was what saved Abraham by grace through faith. Declared righteousness on the basis of faith alone was always in the gospel, even in promise form. Paul's gospel is that gospel, except now with all of the details filled in. Paul's gospel reveals Jesus of Nazareth to not just be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but to be the Lamb who is the Son of David, who is Messiah, who reigns supremely. He is the one who takes away not only the sin of the Jews who believe, but he's the one who takes away the sin of the Gentiles who believe and then puts them into one new body on equal footing. Paul's gospel is that gospel. And it is filled out. There's no more unrevealed truth concerning the gospel yet to come that we don't have. We have all of it. Paul's gospel is that gospel from the Old Testament that was in promise form, but now is filled out. How helpful for the Roman believers. They have not yet met Paul, but they have come to know these holy scriptures. And Paul claims alignment with them in his gospel. Listen, trends are like vapor. The guy at the red light sitting next to me in his car with his window down, he blows out his vapor as he vapes in the cool air. And it's intriguing to watch that cloud just do what it does. It's intriguing. It's it's curious to watch it for about three seconds. And then it's gone. Vapors come, and they're gone before you know it. Trends come, and they're gone before you know it. Paul was not interested in vaporous ideas that came and went in the first century. Paul pointed to the unmovable mountain of the gospel that outlasted the Amalekites, the Philistines, the Babylonians, you name it. It wasn't going anywhere. It's been around forever. It's not going anywhere. There's no trend today worth looking at. The good news is old news and make no apology for it. The Romans can take comfort because Paul's gospel is not something that they should have their antenna up about. They shouldn't be on guard about it. Rather, his gospel is their old friend they already have read and have come to love in their Old Testament. It just has more details now for them. God's gospel is not new. Paul next moves to that in the gospel that he is most caught up with, Jesus Christ. God's gospel, secondly, centers on God's son, verses 3 to 6. The first part of verse 3, concerning his son, modifies the gospel of God in verse 1. It is the gospel of God concerning his son. God's eternal, God's divine son who shares his nature 
as God, that is the focal point. He is the focal point of the gospel, according to Paul. Again, the gospel doesn't focus in on good advice. It focuses in on a person, the eternal divine person who is God's son. Now, let's unpack carefully what Paul wants to say about this eternal divine son of God who is Jesus. There are three important issues concerning God's son. First, God's gospel centers on God's son who was humbled into the messianic line. That's verse 3. God's son was humbled into the messianic line. Look at verse 3. Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. The eternal son of God humbled himself, made himself low, and even made himself weak when he was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Listen, David's flesh, David's humanity was weak. When the eternal son of God took on flesh, he took on that weakness of David's flesh except without sin. John even read that to us in Hebrews 2. The eternal son of God added this weakness of David's flesh to his deity. He didn't cease to be God when that happened. He just added humanity to his deity in the person of Jesus. He grew tired. He grew hungry, thirsty, and most importantly, he was susceptible now to human death in his flesh. But all of this took place in the line of David's flesh, David's humanity, David's descent. Why, why does Paul even mention this about David concerning his son? Remember how this gospel was promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures, that it's old news? Think about this with me. Has God initiated his gospel promise after the fall? In Genesis 3.15, God began very broadly and generally with the gospel promise. I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your seed, snake, and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. The promise from the very beginning was that from Eve would come one who would crush the serpent's head one day and deliver Eve's offspring. God directed then that good news toward a little bit more specific nature in a man named Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. In you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In your seed, a deliverer will come, one who will bless the nations. God further then narrowed that gospel promise into the tribe of Judah. And he introduced the idea that the one who would come would be kingly. And from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter that a king has shall not depart from the tribe of Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until it comes to him to whom it belongs. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Hold on to that idea of obedience. Then God narrowed it down even further within the tribe of Judah, did he not? Narrowed that promise in the gospel down specifically to one man in the tribe of Judah, David. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. You will always have a son to sit on my throne. That's why David matters. That's why the eternal son of God entered into the fleshly weakness of David's messianic line. One of his sons would be the delivering king for God in his promised gospel. The eternal son in that fleshy condition which was marked by weakness. He tired, he hungered, he thirsted, he was subject to death. That condition of weakness that the eternal son took on himself, let me ask you, was that the end goal that God had for him? Of course not. There's much, much more. God's plan was that the eternal son, but 
humbled son of God, subject to the weakness of David's flesh, would one day cross a line out of that weakness into a condition of power. A condition not of humiliation anymore, but a condition of exaltation as the Son of God, reigning Messiah from David's line. When was that? What was the line that resulted in power as opposed to weakness? It was when the eternal Son of God was raised from the dead. Secondly, God's gospel centers on God's Son who was exalted, exalted to messianic rule. Look at verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, upon his resurrection, was no longer in a condition of humiliation and weakness. Upon his resurrection, he stood out and could be declared someone much, much different than all of the other sons of David. He was completely set apart from them. Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, uh, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Joaz, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, all the sons of David that we have record of who were on the throne until the deportation. They were all sons of David according to the flesh too. But the eternal Son of God, who entered into the weakness of David's flesh, now is the Son of God with power. That phrase, with power, in verse 4, modifies the Son of God. He is the Son of God with power. That's the contrast. He was in the weakness of the flesh. He is now the Son of God with power. Son of God with power. And the Holy Spirit was there as the standard by which that declaration or designation could be made regarding the Son of God. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Listen, think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in regards to Jesus. The Holy Spirit helped him stoop into his humiliation, and conceived him in Mary. The Holy Spirit helped him stoop even lower into the waters of baptism when he identified with our sinful weakness, even though he never sinned. The Spirit came down upon him like a dove. And here is the Holy Spirit helping him Ascend, being the standard by which he would ascend. He is the spirit of holiness. This is holy, what is going on. He was the eternal son of God with weakness. Now, he is the eternal son of God with power because of his resurrection. That was the aim of God for his eternal son, to finally one day be exalted to messianic rule. When he became flesh, he was not the Davidic messianic ruler as he could ultimately be. His resurrection was the key. He had to undergo it as Messiah, the son of David, the eternal son of God. Now, what we know Paul is not saying here is that Jesus became the son of God at the resurrection. He was always the son of God. He made that clear. He made that so clear that the Pharisees understood it and wanted to kill him because he made himself out to be equal with God. That was not the issue here. What was the issue at his resurrection was that the Son of God was now declared or appointed to no longer be the Son of God characterized by the weakness of David's flesh. Rather, he was declared to be the Son of God characterized by power. The Messiah, King, God's Son to rule through his resurrection from the dead. This is the strongest statement that could be made concerning messianic kingship of the Son of God who is the central focus of the gospel promise beforehand but now is filled out in Paul's gospel. Is this not what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2? Turn just for a moment, look at this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Christ Jesus, who, 
Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself uh, by becoming obedient to the point of death. It just keeps descending for him. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are under, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And as Paul says in Romans 1.4, this one is Jesus Messiah, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. He is Lord He's the king. He's the master. He's the one that all of the gospel and promise form now has arrived at. God's gospel centers on God's son. Thirdly, who is glorified through the obedience of faith. He is God's son who is glorified through the obedience of faith, verses 5 and 6. Through whom? Through Jesus Christ our Lord we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also, you Romans also, are the called of Jesus Christ. After his resurrection from the dead, the Son of God with all power, what did he do? He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's what he told him after his resurrection. What did he do? He instructed his apostles and he commissioned them to take the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, to all of the Gentiles. And what Paul tells us is that the resurrected and exalted Son of God, who is the Messiah King, the one with all authority in heaven and on earth, that that one has given something that ultimately ends up glorifying his name, which is above every name that has ever been named. What did he give? Look at verse 5. Through him, Paul says, we have received it. I think he is speaking here, we as an apostle. Grace and apostleship is what he gave. Most likely, I think the way to take this is the grace that is apostleship. The grace of God um, is, is a gift in apostleship even to Paul. The grace of God that just made Paul an apostle upon receiving it. What was Paul to do with that grace-given apostleship? He was, verse 5, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations. Among all the nations, among all the Gentiles. Now, many think what Paul means by the obedience of faith is the obedience that follows faith in the gospel. In other words, saving faith will produce obedience to the one trusted. And that is certainly true theologically. That is absolutely true. The question is whether that is what is on, on Paul's mind at this point in his focus on the powerful son who reigns as king in his resurrection. Or does Paul have something else very important on his mind with this phrase? Let me humbly put forth what I think Paul was to do with this grace-given apostleship. He was commissioned by the exalted Son with power. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's the one who commissioned him. He has the name above every name that has ever been named. He was commissioned by that one. And when Paul preached the gospel, he didn't go under the authority of that one and make suggestions. What did he do? He put forth two commands, repent and believe. Repent and believe. The gospel puts a demand on the nations, on the Gentiles. Both Jews and Gentiles had to obey the demand of the gospel. What's the demand of the gospel? Faith. How do you obey the demand of the gospel? By placing your faith in Jesus Christ by placing your faith alone in the Son of God, who is the focus of the gospel. To believe the gospel is to be obedient to the gospel of this mighty king. Amen. 
Now, let me show you the opposite of this obedience of faith. Turn over to Romans chapter 10, verse 16. Paul says it just the opposite in Romans chapter 10, verse 16. Watch this. He's talking about Israel, rebellious Israel. And he says in verse 16, however they, Israel, did not all heed or obey the good news. They didn't obey the gospel. They didn't heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report? Now, turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me show you this again. Paul says it even more graphically. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed, verse 7, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, that one who has all authority in heaven and earth is coming back, and it will be terrifying. He will come back dealing out retribution. To whom? To those who do not know God and to those who do not what? Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Listen, there is a disobedience to the gospel. To be disobedient to the gospel is what? To not believe him, to believe it. It's, we could call it the disobedience of unbelief. You can disobey the gospel. How? By not believing it. Paul is saying just the opposite of it back in Romans chapter 1, verse 5. And he also says it actually in Romans 16, verse 25. The Gentiles had to obey the gospel. How? By believing it. By putting faith in this one. That is the obedience which is the faith they must put in the gospel. So let me put this together for you. The resurrected and exalted Son of God with power. What did he do? He graced Paul with apostleship so that Paul might secure the obedience to the gospel from all of the Gentiles, which is faith in the gospel. The Gentiles must obey this exalted, powerful Messiah King. If he says, repent and believe, you obey him. It's not a suggestion. And when Paul's grace-given apostleship accomplished that, when Gentiles obeyed in believing, that glorified Messiah King, the exalted Son of God. Look what he says in verse 5. To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. His name is the one that is above all names. What glorifies him most right now is when sinners obey him in his call to the gospel by believing God's gospel centers on God's Son who is glorified through the obedience which is known as faith in the gospel. And notice what Paul says about the Romans in relationship to his grace-given apostleship. Look at verse 6. Among whom? Among who, who, who's the, whom is the whom? Among all the Gentiles. You are among them. You also are the called of Jesus Christ. He puts them in relationship to himself. They are among those Gentiles that Paul has been sent to labor in. You're in my field, he says, that I was sent to labor in. I was sent to go labor in the field of all of the Gentiles, and guess what? I find you there too. You're some of the called of Jesus Christ. I have a right to be concerned that you indeed have obeyed the gospel by believing it. And notice he calls them, you also are the called of Jesus Christ. How do any of the Gentiles come to the obedience that is faith in the gospel? There's only one way anybody ever comes to the obedience that is faith in the gospel. What? Jesus opens his mouth as the king who has all authority in heaven and on earth and he calls and you are effectually woken up. And you believe. It's a powerful call from the king. You also are the called of Jesus Christ, he says. No one can believe unless called. 
Therefore, no one can obey the call of the gospel to believe unless Jesus Christ effectually calls them. The call to wake up from your deadness, to wake up from your rebellion against him, to hear his voice as the life-giving king who will come back and deal out retribution to everyone who does not know him or who does not obey his gospel call. Wake up. It's not a suggestion. It's not good advice. It is a command from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Your knee one day will bow. It will. Bow now. Bow now. And do you see more clearly now how these two provisions, God's apostle and God's gospel, they are inseparable. The gospel is the good news of this resurrected, exalted Son of God with power. His death paid the penalty for sinners who believe the gospel concerns him, that resurrected and exalted Messiah with power, he graced his slave. He graced him with apostleship so that through the preaching of the gospel, the Gentiles might obey his gospel by believing it. Jesus calls them to that response in the preaching of the gospel. And today that call comes to you through the apostles' words written down. How does this intertwining of the apostle and, and the gospel flesh itself out in us today? We, if we want to turn to the gospel, filled out, we have to turn to one of the writings of the apostles. Even still, it can't be separated. How do you pull these apart when Jesus so intertwined them? Number three. The last provision for those who have believed is God's blessing. And it's all found in the way that Paul addresses the Romans in his introduction in verse 7. Notice he doesn't even address them until he made it clear that they were within his boundaries. It was kind of him. Oh, we're one of those that Paul has been sent to. Even though he never planted us, even though we don't know him, we're in his field. And now he's talking to us. He's addressing them because he's been sent to all of the Gentiles and he has a right to them as well. As believers in this gospel, notice how Paul describes them. Notice how he thinks of them. He says, verse 7, you are beloved of God. Beloved. Is there any greater blessing they could have than this? Being the object of God's affectionate and self-giving love. This is how the Apostle Paul thinks of these he's never met. Why wouldn't they listen to him? Look how, they, look how he described them. What a reminder of this blessing. They are, verse 7, called saints. Called as saints, better to be translated just called saints. Effectually called holy ones. Paul likes this word, doesn't he, in this passage? It's the third time we've heard the word call. God's power in calling is here again. God called, and Paul was an apostle. Paul didn't go through a process of becoming an apostle over time. God called the Romans in 1-6, and the Romans obeyed the gospel by believing it. They didn't go through a process of learning how to obey it and believing it. God called the Romans here in verse 7, and Boom, holy ones, saints. They did not slowly transition into holiness. What does this mean? You know what this means? It means God's call has creative power to create you into something you never were before and to do it instantly. He speaks to Paul, he calls Paul, and Paul just is an apostle. He calls the Romans who were disobedient in their disbelief and they just obey by believing. He calls the Romans who are stained in their sin and unholy and they just are holy ones. What a blessing on the Romans. This is how Paul thinks of them. This effectual call of God. Paul extends to them in verse 7, grace. Undeserved favor. It's the one word that could easily sum up all of what the gospel is about. God looks past them and what they deserve from him, and he gives them grace instead. And what is the result of grace in the believer's life but peace? 
peace with God. The believers in Rome are no longer at war with God, but they are reconciled by the grace of God in Jesus. Listen, grace is what we receive from God, and peace is then what we experience with God. What kindness is from this apostle who doesn't even know them. He's saying things to them that nobody has ever said to them in any letter that has ever been to them, written to them. And this grace and this peace, it comes, verse 7, from God who is our Father and Jesus Christ who is our Lord. He is that exalted Son of God with power, messianic King, Lord. It comes from a Father who loves comes from the exalted Lord Jesus. How blessed we are to have a father and to have a king. With this opening introduction, how could they not listen to the rest of the letter? What about you? What about you? Are you one of God's beloved? Have you been powerfully recreated in his call? Are you a holy one? I'm not asking if you're trying to do good things and be better. Have you just been called and are holy in his sight? Have you received undeserved favor from God and are you now experiencing peace with God because you're not at war with him anymore? Do you know what that all depends on? That all depends on if you have obeyed the demand of the king in the gospel. Have you believed him? Do you trust him? Have you turned from your sin? Everything inside you and in the world today would tell you to trust namely in yourself. Believe in yourself. It is a lie. It is a trend. It is a vapor. Trust the king. Why can you trust him? Because in his humiliation, he came and he took on flesh and even blood, and he shed the blood at the cross, his blood, to be your substitute, to pay the penalty for you. Belief. Don't disobey the gospel by disbelieving. Obey and believe. Let's pray. You are God our Father, and Jesus, you are our Lord. How blessed we are to have a Father who loves us like we are, and a a Lord who masters us and cares for us and guides us and provides for us everything we need. Lord, help us to become lost in our slavery to your Son. Let us enjoy more what it means to be a child of yours and what it means to be a slave of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we rejoice this morning that you did not make our holiness something we had to achieve, but once and for all with declared righteousness because of our faith, you called us holy. It is all of your doing, and to have a status that will never change, that I can never tarnish, even though I sin even boldly against you sometimes, Lord, what a, what a blessing to be called saint. Father, may we revel today in your love for us as a church because you have loved us in your Son who is the great subject and center of the gospel. He is not a weak man, quiet, sitting off, content to let his suggestion in the gospel be forgotten. He is the Son of God, raised with exalted power from the line of Messiah, Uh, David, who is Messiah, who is now at your right hand. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are great. You are exalted. 
and you are coming to deal out retribution. Oh, Father, in the meantime, may we run with a pardon saying, obey his pardon, believe him. Be merciful to sinners through our preaching of the gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.